And if it's a choice between being pessimistic and optimistic, I never discuss that. If you're watching the New York Rangers play or have some whatever team it might be, the, the Canucks in hockey, if you're, a, if you're a, in the stands, you can be optimistic or pessimistic. But if you're a player, there's only one game. You're either determined or you're defeated. If you're defeated, the coach is going to pull you. So the only game left in town is to be determined. You get on with it and you do everything you can because it's an important, necessary, joyful, essential process. Yeah, it's a thing to get excited about. And welcome to today's Climate Emergency Forum. Today we'll be discussing a transition to an ecological civilization. And to discuss that, we have a very special guest who we're honored to receive today, Guy Dancy. Guy is a futurist who works to develop a positive vision of a sustainable future and to translate that vision into action. He is founder of the British Columbia Sustainable Energy Association and co-founder of the newly formed British Columbia Climate Emergency Network, and is the author or co-author of 10 books, including The Climate Challenge, 101 Solutions to Global Warming and Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible. He lives on Vancouver Island in Canada. He is currently completing a new book on the economics of kindness, a 10-year transition to a green cooperative economy. Well, an economics of kindness is, is kind of a mind blowing concept, Guy. I'd love to hear more about it. Thanks, Regina. It's, it's intended to be an oxymoron to make people think, how's that possible? How's that possible, right? So I have worked in the climate trenches for some 25 years. Um, very engaged in solutions in emergency. I I've all the time have that core feeling, which I believe everyone needs. That if you think you've understood the climate emergency and you haven't had that awful sinking feeling in your belly, you haven't really understood it. So I you know, fully know how grim things are when you look at it face on without any filters. And I've also seen people struggling with being a climate activist when they're only focusing on the negative, how bad it's gonna be and this and that and the other. And I've seen, been just talked in schools where the children are only taught in terms of the impacts and they get overwhelmed and defeated and, and just don't know what to do. And they, they have a slogan, they are now saying, so you'll die of old age, we'll die of climate change. That's the kind of mental thinking that's that framing has given to them. And so, all my life, I've had a, a positive vision of this amazing universe that we're in as a purposeful place. That we're not just drifting like meaningless atoms heading towards a heat, heat death of the universe. There's purpose in what we're doing. We're integrated with all other species. We're part of nature. And the evolution of our species, starting with a, in a couple of atoms, you know, back 13 billion years ago, and this phenomenal complexity of who we are is a, a simultaneous co-evolution, both of matter and of consciousness slash spirit. So the key thing is purpose. We have agency, we choose what we do with it. What is our purpose? Where are we going? And I believe at a fundamental level that the, the story with which we have followed for the last, ever since the enlightenment, which is progress, science, reason, exploration, discovery, exploit nature, progress, more progress, economic growth has come to an end. Um, you, you, if you grow an economy by, economy by 3% a year, you're doubling its size every 24 years. And so it's just ludicrous to think that you can have endless economic growth on a small limited planet. We know that that's not true. And I believe that we're now turning towards the next stage of our civilization, having gone through the agriculture, the hunter-gatherer phase, the agricultural phase, the industrial phase, we're about to move into a new ecological civilization premised on a rediscovery of our harmony with nature, our complete integration with nature and all that we are. And 
the work I'm doing currently is looking at the economics of that and how does that turn into economic expression? Because I've always found that the most intimidating part of my life. I trained in sociology. I've written books on climate and all sorts of other stuff. But I always felt intimidated when you think about the economy and central banking and how does finance work and how do companies work. And when you read The Economist, it, reads, it feels boring and it is boring. And so for the last, last five years, I've really dug into economics to find out what is going wrong here, what's it all about, and, and discovering that everyone says that, you know, the, the current paradigm that governs conventional economic thought, and the paradigm is the big framework of assumptions. The current paradigm is based on the assumption that economics is a science. And to make it a science, we want to have a, a unit of measure that's replicable and mathematically controllable. And so they decided back in the late 1800s, that unit of science would be a, a, a representative agent who is always rational and always selfish and self-interested. Now we'd normally call that person a psychopath, but that is defined to be the core unit of all human involvement in the economy. And that in turn, that came from the desire by economists in the 1800s to do away with the discussion of power and politics. Because um, when up until the 1840s or so, economics was called political economy. And people like you know, John Stuart Mill were talking about human choice and, the, and civilization and <clears throat> the, the, the purpose of civilization, <clears throat> excuse me. Then the socialists and Marxists got involved with a great vision of revolution and another form of inevitable history that we're going to sort of, you know, overturn the world and the working classes will rule the world. And, and a lot of people didn't like the revolutionary talk. So the early economists said, let's eliminate power entirely and make economics a science that's rational. So we end up with this belief that every unit must maximize its, its rational utility in the world. And every business in the world operates on the basis we must maximize shareholder value. And core economists says that's the only thing a business should do. And then we wonder why fossil fuel companies are driven by shareholder demand to maximize their return on investment. Because in standard economics, everything else, human loss, worker exploitation, climate emergency, biodiversity loss is an externality. It's like an awkward thing that we really don't know how to deal with. And when you come down to the core of, of, of thinking about um, what, what economics is and what the economy is, it gets, it, it's really fascinating because I had to dig into this and I did a lot of reading around anthropology and, and economic history. And it turns out the entire conflict between left and right, pro-government pro or, or pro-freedom is, is completely erroneous, it's completely wrong. The, the Marxist socialist economic thinking that gave place to the sort of the good left-wing thinking is, is based on completely phony historical scientific assumptions and so is the neoliberal right-wing thinking. They're both completely erroneous. The real issue, and one of the four core reasons for all our troubles today, is the conflict between the hu ancient human desire to dominate and the ancient human desire to cooperate, or the impulse. That's sort of genetic, cultural genetic. We get the impulse to dominate and to be hierarchical from our primate ancestry, going back to the chimpanzees, and you can see it everywhere from the tumultuous two-year-old determined to dominate the family, through to the person who takes over a nonprofit and goes crazy, through to Donald Trump who runs a whole country like a crazy. The most important thing is to dominate, to win, and the whole thing is seen as that. And yet when the hunter-gatherers came along, they said, we don't like this. And when they had language and spears, they, they overthrew their alpha male and said, we don't want an alpha male anymore. We're gonna cooperate. And for 300,000 years, the hunter-gatherers had a strict regime of cooperation where they took care to suppress their dominators using teasing, um, joking, ostracism, and if need be, assassination. They, we domesticated our species to be more cooperative by driving the strict alpha male genes to a lower place in the gene pool. Because when the alpha males were in charge, only they could breed. They dominated all the sex. With hunter-gatherers, like everyone can have sex now and enjoy ourselves, and it's much more fun. And so we domesticated ourselves and became less aggressive. And so phenomenally cooperative species, but our economies the hunter-gatherers were overthrown in the end when we got a food surplus because people started, ah, I don't need to share so much, I can keep it to myself. And we have what's called achievement societies for around 5,000 years. And then when the achievement societies started allowing inheritance, so those who are the most successful passed on their achievements to their children. With, with inheritance, you got the birth of total inequality and the return of the impulse to dominate. Empires, kings, rulers, the works. And for all of our known history that we learn in schools, dominators have been in charge and we take domination for granted. 
but yet the, and the cooperators have been constantly trying to get a hand on things and trying to get an idea in. And especially over but the whole the whole market economy is inherently cooperative. You know, how else do you trade a 10, 100 billion transactions a day without any violence? It's a very cooperative process. But the dominators come in and they want to sort of maximize their advantage. So when we build a new ecological civilization premised on cooperation and ecological knowledge and awareness and a new story as to what we're doing and we get rid of the false economic ideas of around neoliberalism and stuff like that and neoclassical economics it becomes possible to vision an entire economy where you change the charter for every business so that every business must become a social purpose business which they're tracking the benefits not just to their shareholders investors but to their workers the communities where they work and the whole environment around them and they're tracking every year their impact on nature, their progress towards becoming, you know, using renewable energy, their progress to restore ecosystems. And you begin to see how we can change all businesses, we can change all banks, we can change the whole way whole central banking works so that it builds a new ecological civilization and throws all the resources we need at the climate emergency and the biodiversity emergency. And there's so much new learning to do here. So I will typically talk to a group of, of climate activists and say, how many of you know what quantitative easing is, which is the method that central banks use to bail out the bankers in the 2008 financial crisis, which is basically printing money. And now they're printing money to handle the, the COVID crisis, and as they should, because central banks can create money without causing inflation when there's an emergency. And you can't have a bigger emergency than the climate and biodiversity emergency. And central banks can print money to tackle every aspect of that emergency that, that is, cannot be handled by investment. So building retrofits can be handled by investment. But central banks can also give 0% interest. You know, a government can create climate bonds and the central bank can buy them or underwrite them, enable them to be issued at 0% interest. So you've got all the financing you need for every solar and wind installation, every geothermal, every building retrofit, every sort of industrial shift over from making steel from coal to making it through green hydrogen, all that stuff is financeable. And all that stuff generates jobs. So when you give people a vision of this future, where you've got a whole whack of new jobs, you can say no one will be left behind. Every worker who's resistant about the change because they're gonna lose their job in coal mining or in making conventional cars is guaranteed a career transition path with paid training and paid financial support to get a job in the new economy. There are so many jobs needed to craft this transition to a new ecological, ecological civilization. And, and when you've had that mind frame for a while, you begin to think, wow, this is a really great future we're moving towards. So you have two things going. You have a vision of a really powerful, attractive future you want to live in. And the scare factor of like the climate emergency is getting stronger and deeper every year and that the tipping factors are getting stronger and faster. So how fast can you move? And then you look at the 2030s as the decade of transformation, the critical decade when stuff has to be done. But you see it in action when governments right now are upping their goals from, well, we'll do a 30% reduction by 2030, no, a 40% reduction. No, as Germany was recently called up, the whole German government was called up by the courts to say your, your goals are not fast enough. And just today, they increased their goal to a 65% reduction in emissions by 2030. And then you add to that the public demand for annual goals, as well as 10 yearly goals. 10 yearly goal is a lazy thing for a politician. You can ignore it and then they might not even be in office. If your annual goals, which is an eight to 10% reduction in emissions every year, and then you track that by different means and you begin to get the sense that, yeah, maybe this can be achieved. And then you're really tackling the big difficult challenges like the Chinese coal mining, Indonesia, Australia, which are exporting coal and determined to get more coal happening and misunderstandings around natural gas that believe it's a bridge fuel. Natural gas from fracking involves methane emissions, which makes it as bad as coal. It needs to be seen to be as bad as coal. So we're about to start a campaign in British Columbia to, to that no new building should be allowed to use natural gas at all. Use a heat, electric heat pump, passive house standard, you don't need gas at all. The whole future is gonna be electric. The new story came through today about one of the big oil fields in, in, in somewhere in the Middle East, how the, there's 3000 square miles they need or square kilometers to generate the oil over so far. You get more energy per year by covering that area with solar at $2 a megawatt hour or two cents a kilowatt hour kilowatt generation cost than with oil. This phenomenal 
energy available from wind and solar, this phenomenal storage capacities, this phenomenal, anyone who's driven an electric car knows how great it is. Everyone, anyone who's been on an electric bike knows they're too fast to be healthy, right? <laughs> they're, they're a problem because they're too good and too efficient. All this is doable. All this is a sort of manageable change. And when you add to that, that the vision of urban greening, so that within the cities, you're, you're beginning to plant more trees, have more bike lanes, narrow the streets down, have streets where people, all the cars go at five miles an hour. People are talking to each other again. You're re-establishing connections in neighborhood. You're having urban farms. You're restoring nature. You're having gl great global ecological restoration projects to bring back nature to the way it was before we started you know, slaughtering it, massacring it, and harvesting it. You think, wow, this is a doable thing. And I know from the people I circulate with, all the young people and young, there's an instinctive knowledge that we need to know that we're, to, we're part of nature, we discover our harmony with nature and say, let's make this happen. And if it's a choice between being pessimistic and optimistic, I never discuss that. If you're watching the New York Rangers play or have some, whatever team it might be, the, the Canucks in hockey, if you're, a, if you're a, in the stands, you can be optimistic or pessimistic. But if you're a player, there's only one game. You're either determined or you're defeated. If you're defeated, the coach is going to pull you. So the only game left in town is to be determined. You get on with it and you do everything you can because it's an important, necessary, joyful, essential process. Yeah, it's a thing to get excited about. Thanks. OK, thanks, Guy. So I, I'm Peter Carter. Um, uh, I live fairly close to Guy in British Columbia. I've known Guy for a great many years. Um, and uh, as usual, Guy, your presentation was packed with information and uh, totally brilliant. So uh, I, I want to start by just repeating um, what now really your, your um, vision and mission is, um, because I think it is absolutely great and absolutely compelling. I just want to repeat those two words, the economics of kindness, kindness. Wonderful. We're going to go a long way with that. And I'm so glad that um, you are working on this. Um, uh, and uh, you've obviously learned everything that needs to be learned about it. No, okay. no, not yet, not yet at all, no. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, I'm lucky because I get to be first. So I get to ask you what you mean and your tongue-in-cheek definition of GDP. Oh, GDP, gross depletion of the planet. Right on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because right now, with all, unless the thing you buy is clearly certified as being organic or truly properly sustainable, it is effectively chipping away at the planet. And so every initial, every increase, every incremental dollar of GDP is a gross depletion of the planet. Yeah. That's how we need to think of GDP. That's what, very well put. So, um, I'd, li I'd like to turn to something that was in your um, recent interview and um, the, uh, the war factor, the military factor, where that comes in. I talk about the economy when I, when I get rid of class neoclassical economics and think about it from scratch. The economy starts with, there are, there are, it's a, every economy is a bundle of five economies. Nature's economy is the beginning and end of everything, obviously. Right? That's the start of things and not an externality. Then you have human agency and human agency operates first in the social economy, which is all the exchanges we do without money, whether it's caring, volunteering, child raising, family, all that stuff. Then we have the community economy when we're working in the economy with social values to care for our community, create jobs locally, create affordable housing locally. Then we have the market economy, which would be the bigger frame globally. And then we have the public economy where the government gets engaged. In each of those economies, human agency can either work to be a dominator or to be a cooperator. If we all work to be cooperators, we create more room for kindness. Because in a cooperative world, people feel more free to be kind. But the war economy is an invasive virus that's trying to infect every one of those five economies with aggressive self-interest and profit maximization. And so it's that I don't see it as a military thing necessary. It's a psychological state of mind when you aggressively want to dominate and win and regardless of all the costs. I just want to say um, great explanation. Thank you. Um, I appreciate so much your turn of phrase of the not just the climate emergency, but your, uh, you refer to it as the climate and biodiversity emergency. 
um, uh, we all need to uh, remember that and repeat that phrase as well, as well as the economics of kindness. Um, final thought on, um, on that? Well, it, it's just critical. When you look at the loss of species, the loss of insects, um, the depletion of, of life in the ocean, the, 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 the destruction we're doing of the, 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 wild, the fisheries in the ocean, the, the, the destruction of the soil through use of pesticides, it's just a disaster. It's a, it's a, and the two are so hand in hand together, because like, a, you know, a, around, a, you know, 20% of the climate crisis is caused by the destruction of nature to explicitly from the destruction of forests. And then the, the methods of farming that are destroying nature are also putting out so many emissions tied up with nitrous oxide emissions and the, the lack of biomass and the lack of carbon storage and so on. So they're, they're so integrated and you get many more people on board when you integrate the two together. We should not be separating them. Right. Thanks very much, Guy. Thanks. It's always great talking with you. I always feel better when I've had a conversation with you. <laughs> So, uh, so, so thanks, thank you um, for for a very um, you know an excellent discussion uh, thus far, both uh, Guy and uh, Peter. And if I call you Guy, so you it's not a problem, not a problem. Please excuse me. Uh, I've been known to do that. Um, let's talk about the. I want to get your idea of sort of the trajectories of humanity because if you like. You know, we can look, there, there, there's a couple of different views here. You know, hopefully we end up with your vision of what you've discussed as, as a world in the future. But my question is, is, do you think that we can reach that vision without having a major collapse of civilization first? Because I'm of the view, right, you know, just thinking about it with abrupt climate change occurring so fast, and we're doing, we seem to be doing everything wrong, not just neutral, neutrally wrong, but we're actually amplifying and magnifying the problem with everything we do. For example, you know, with the COVID um, shutdowns and the virus, the government has just put huge amounts of money into supporting the fossil fuel industry, whereas that money could have gone completely to, you know, changing our society. It could have gone into renewables, it could have gone into climate change, uh, way, you know, ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere, um, research onto, you know, more efficient deployment of, of renewable energies, et cetera. So we, we've got to, you know, so, so in terms of the trajectory of where we're heading, I, I tend to, lately more, I've had the view that we're never going to reach a position, a world that you're talking about, unless there's a total and utter collapse. Like unless, for example, we lose Arctic sea ice in, in a few years and we have a global famine in a decade. Many people, you know, many countries, government going down, just total turmoil when there's global famines that can happen. So, so what are your views on, on, on that sort of sort of thing. Well, I, I don't see anything quite so stark as that. I, I believe that we will see continued sea level rise for a very long time to come and it could get very dramatic but by definition except when you get a big tsunami type storm it will be slow and gradual. I mean I just wrote a, a big piece about the future of Hawaii set in 200 years in the future and yes the sea is lapping on the shores of the Capitol building in Honolulu but it's been slow and gradual. For the collapse of civilization, it's all, there, are, it, it's, there are patches of America where it's already collapsing, where, where the, the ability to hold civilization together by a civilized relationship with each other has gotten in danger. Um, the, the key thing that holds a civilization together is the story that people believe in. And it's much bigger than a white picket fence, although that stands in for the story for a lot of America. And in every biological system, when entropy gets a hold, things start to collapse. But science is, the, the laws of the universe are governed by a principle called syntropy as well as entropy. And syntropy happens through consciousness, which scientists have difficulty understanding. But consciousness exists. It'd be tough for you to deny that it exists. And through consciousness, we use our agency and we use our agency to improve things. So every marriage will collapse if you don't constantly put love and care into it. Every house will get filthy if you don't constantly you know, restore it. A civilization can, can collapse if you don't constantly renew it and rejuvenate it. So when and all the change you're talking about, about say investments in, in climate or not, are dependent on, on activism. 
this phenomenal activism been happening for the last year for a green recovery, green investments, green pressure. Every day the emails are going in, we're phoning MLAs, we're talking to them to change the nature of how that happens. And in America, phenomenal response because Biden is actually incorporating a lot of this stuff. He's, he's talking directly to the Sunrise Movements, people like that, and they're having an influence. You can argue with it, it needs to go further. So if you picture that transition that happened in the 1930s when the, green, when the New Deal happened, and so many ideas got changed, and we applied that thinking to the 2020s, a whole new sense of government engagement um, and massive investment in the things that are needed tied to the jobs. If people pick up on the hope, they say, oh, this is gonna give us a better future. The mental framing will change, which enables us to do the political changes. Um, it's very tough to stop the big turnaround changes like the melting Antarctica, the melting glaciers. That's why sea level will continue. There's gonna be con const We're living, for, we're gonna have a hundred years of simultaneous crisis and disorder and birthing of a new ecological civilization. They go hand in hand. When the industrial age was born, it was born simultaneously with the chaos of those horrible dark satanic mills. The one didn't neutralize the other, they both coexisted. Great, okay, well, thank you. And thank you for all your work, Paul, too, I should say. Well, thank you Peter, Peter for all your work, yeah. Well, thank you. So Guy, um, you've brought up a lot of really important issues and uh, I, I wanna just quickly refer back to your TED talk that you did. Oh my goodness, that was like 15 years ago. Oh yeah, it was a while ago. And um, one of the questions that you asked the audience was you know, to raise their hands if they thought that humans would be here a million years from now. And you know, the hands went up for yes or for no. And um, my first thought was, I hope not. Um, because I am one of those persons who does see humanity, you know, one of the things that I see it as a problem. And I think part of the problem is you discussed that we're integrated with other species, but I think throughout our whole history, we've been trying to pull ourselves away and differentiate ourselves from other species. And this has created this schism within ourselves. And it's also, um, impelled this desire to dominate. And I feel as though it's part of the DNA, particularly, I know that um, there's something called the warrior gene in the male DNA. And, and even though um, I, I, I have heard you say that um, these wars over oil uh, you know, will eventually stop, I, I contend that that perhaps may be eventually, but then we'll have new wars such as the war for water. And so my thought is how do we move from this competition to cooperation, when in fact, we're seeing right now the era of the alpha male, such as Trump, Bolsonaro, Putin, Duterte, the, these types of male leaders are, are valorized. So how so do we change? There's two aspects to this. It's first the ecological dimension and the human dimension. In the ecological dimension, we are learning as by trial and error as we go along. Every time, the human species came to a new territory which had not seen humans before, we wiped out all the large megafauna. And even when there were too many buffalo, we drive them over the cliff and then just pick up the kidneys. I say we collectively for all humans. And then the First Nations of North America presumably learned by their mistakes, they whoops, let's not do that, better have respect for nature. And so we approach everything with ecological ignorance initially, because we're not taught it. And so making ecological education a prime necessity for every child as fundamental as reading, writing, arithmetic is a core essential for the future. Because we need to learn this stuff. You don't learn, you don't, you're not born knowing what methane emissions are. You've got to learn this stuff. We can't afford to have cabinet ministers who don't understand the carbon cycle. On the human dimension, if I can patronize you for a second, your mind frame is being colonialized by 5,000 years of rule by dominators. We had 300,000 years of, of cooperative hunter gathering when they went out of the way to suppress the dominator gene. They knew it's there, it's real, there is a dominator gene. It comes from our alpha, our alpha male chimpanzee background. They knew they had to suppress it. The evidence shows that 75% of humans want to be cooperators and 25% want to be dominators who play by status. They run the show at the moment but for the last 200 years, they've been running less and less and less of it. The whole progress of democracy enables us to overthrow a dominator and bring in a, a different government. A huge progress. We actually elected um, Trump out of office. So when you look at it in the big picture, um, a million years is a tiny fraction of time geologically. And if we don't 
do some major complete extinction event, which I do not see on the cards, there's no reason to believe we're not going to be around in a million years' time. And a hundred million years' time, frankly. Earth does not, the sun does not turn into a big blazing problem for two billion years. So then I'd like to follow that up if this is the case. What does that mean to the rest of life on Earth? Because I sort of, you know, I see the Elon Musks and these individuals um, wanting to go to Mars and colonize other planets. It, it seems to me they're this idea of like, okay, we've destroyed this one, let's find the next one. You've been living in New York for too long. If you, if you, if you, if you started mixing with the people who are really doing ecological regeneration, who are doing massive waste, the, the whole of the desert of the Middle East is caused by goats. Because when the hunter-gatherers stopped hunter-gathering and they found agriculture wasn't very easy, they found goats and sheep could do what they wanted. And goats and sheep destroy every single living thing there is. And when there's less more desert, there's less evaporation, you get the problem. It is we can restore all that through permaculture principles. There are people who are so in love with nature, who have learned the principles of ecological restoration. We can restore all farmland to being 100% organic, which brings the species back and get just as much food. We can eat, if we stop eating meat or only eat it once a week, you've got way more food than you need on the whole planet because the permacultural principles of organic farming are so fertile. There's so much food and money to be made while doing it. You can manage forests in a way that can bring the timber you need, but they're managed ecologically. So bringing back the old growth qualities. Every ecosystem can be restored and nature, if you let nature do its thing, it, it restores itself really quickly if we just get out of the way. But you have to have every kid having ecological knowledge and experience and exposure to nature directly in the classroom so they leave in love with nature when, before they start their career. Well, thank you so much, Guy. This was uh, all so interesting. And I, Peter and Paul, I love the questions that you have too. And it's good to know, hey, it's great to know that I've been in New York too long. You know, this is one of the things that we New Yorkers struggle with. We have a love-hate relationship with the city. Should I stay, should I go? So yeah, thank you for that reality check. And thank you everyone for joining us here at the Climate Emergency Forum. It's been a really lively discussion. And if you've enjoyed this discussion, uh, please like our video. It helps us with the analytics. You know, we get come further up on the search engine and also uh, share the video, like, and subscribe. So thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you on the next Climate Emergency Forum. <laughs>